The videotaped police interviews which appear in this film were released by the Victoria Police because the Huddle Street killings were of such extraordinary public interest and raised issues of concern to the whole community. More graphic and potentially traumatic material was not released. Melbourne, 9.30pm on Sunday the 9th of August, 1987. An ordinary night in a peaceful city. People were coming back from a weekend in the bush. People were going to work on the night shift. People were coming home from parties or the pub. Just ordinary people going about their ordinary business. They're calling with 303. Calling with 303. Calling with 303. We've just received a call um, from a passerby. There's two cars being shot at in Hoddle Street, just after Rosemead Street. It's uh, 303 uh, Hoddle Street, we're in. Good evening, Macquarie National News. Police have converged on an area near the Clifton Hill Railway Station after an incident in which several people have been shot. Colin Tyrus is at the scene. The exact detail on just what happened is unclear. What we do know is that we have several casualties out here at Clifton Hill, just north of Melbourne, in the inner suburban area. The nightmare for Clifton Hill residents began at the intersection of Ramsden and Hoddle Streets just before 10 p.m. A gunman, armed with two high-powered rifles and a 12-gauge double-barrel shotgun, let fly at passing motorists and anything else that moved. We have five people dead and 11 people at least wounded as a result of the shootings. At present, a man is in custody and he is being interviewed in relation to the shootings. At this stage, it's uh, too early in the investigation to establish a proper motive. It, it didn't hit me till, till a while later that I thought, well, this bloke has deliberately taken aim and tried to kill me. I mean, he didn't know me. I'm driving down the road, minding my own business, just like Skinner was. There's a bloke, a young bloke with a young baby, and his life has just been shattered by this bloke who didn't know him and, and didn't shoot anyone for any particular reason or no reason that we know why. Um, I, I, just, I want an answer, and I'm sure a lot of other people that were involved in it were waiting for an answer. Had it been any other person, I would have thought, kill him, kill the bugger. You know, you can't run around doing that sort of thing. But because it was Julian, I thought, something's gone really wrong here. I know him. He's not a bad person. He's not evil. Why would he kill seven people? It just doesn't make sense at all. In the final tally, Julian Knight killed seven and injured 19 people that night. Why he did so was then a mystery. But since then, he's talked to police, to psychiatrists, and to friends. Tonight, we can provide answers to some of the questions which have tormented his victims and the community. We know how he did it. We know why he did it. And we know at least some of the ways to stop people like him from doing it again. This is the story of what happened before that night, what happened on that night, and what happened afterwards. in Macedonia, in southern Yugoslavia, lies the village of Demir Hisar. This little girl's name is Vesna. She's named after her aunt, who left for Australia with her parents long before little Vesna was born. Her granny has come back to the village to visit. Soon she'll be returning for good. But little Vesna will never see her favourite aunt again. She died aged 24 on a pavement in Hoddle Street, 
12,000 miles away. Много тежко, а то не може да се изкаже с сборови от ИСО. Загубата на Вества, осейкаме да и ние сме тотално загубени. От Вестна ни беше сета радост, сет, сет, сета, сета обайна, шо е гледал не ме разбираш во живот, беше е гледал не кроз Вестна. Како Вестна нема друга. Не дека беше моја, само како Весна, примерна беше во школото, најдобра на секој сакаше да му помага. Весна беше само за помош. Тоа та е слика, не можам да ја заборам цел живот. Јас. Ние не можем никога да се помириме со Никој пат не можеме да се помириме со судбината да Весна изгубивне на, на еден нечовечки начин, ме разбереш, кога некој сакал само желба да си ја исполни, ме разбереш, а ако не ги познава желуѓе да го ги степа. You realise that you're in custody and that you're not obliged to answer any questions unless you wish. And if you do say... Uh, uh, this is the genuine video record of the police interrogation of Julian Knight, just hours after his arrest. He was still deep in shock, unnaturally detached. But he calmly revealed to police that for years he had fantasised about combat. He said you know, I had this desire to kill someone to see what it was like. What age uh, did you have that desire? About 16. Uh, and uh, have you had that desire since then, over a period? Is it uh, been something you've been thinking about over that period, till now? I only to kill someone in combat. And I only to kill someone in combat. Right. One! One! Hey, Two months before the Hoddle Street shooting, Staff Cadet Julian Knight, third class, resigned from the Royal Military College, Duntroon. He had been there only six months, and he left in disgrace with a criminal charge hanging over him. It was the end of an ambition which had been with him since childhood, to be a soldier. I don't think it can be stressed enough that Mr Knight as an individual who had a lifelong preoccupation with the armed services. There's been some misinformation about where that came from. His father, of course, was in the army, but as an academic, not, not as a combat soldier. But nonetheless, you had a boy here who was very interested and preoccupied with the military from an early age. Ten days after he was born, Julian Knight was adopted by an army family. He grew up on army bases in Australia and overseas. He absorbed the army ethos, the slight suspicion and contempt for all things civilian. But when he was 12, his parents split up. He stayed with his mother in Melbourne, and his father moved away. In 1982, Mrs Knight moved in to Ramsden Street, just around the corner from Clifton Hill Railway Station on Hoddle Street. The occasion when the parents separated was very traumatic, in which there were three children weeping and away and this sort of thing felt very rejected there. Uh, and this was in the setting of um, his military background, his father as a soldier. Uh, and uh, uh, he admired his father. Uh, and uh, so that was also a critical, particular critical rejection. It was the first of many rejections in Julian Knight's life. He was asked to leave Westbourne Grammar, where he clashed with the headmaster. Yet while he was there, he was popular enough. Well, I, I met Julian when I was in grade six at Westbourne Grammar, and uh, we became quite close friends then. And uh, what I remember about those days is that he was always the class clown, making jokes, entertaining everybody, uh, that sort of thing. He was very funny, and he was pretty smart, pretty intelligent, uh, always had pretty good marks. <laughs> Yet Julian Knight had one peculiarity. All young kids, and some older ones, like to play soldiers. But Julian Knight developed a fantasy life about soldiering, which became an obsession. His fantasy, his daydreams, were tied up with the idea that to be a soldier is a very romantic thing. It's a very exciting and, and a personally motivating thing. Some of his dreams were about himself dying in combat 
as a hero protecting his company, or in other cases, it would be he fighting against overwhelming odds. And this is something which provided a lot of gratification to him. I mean, everybody's got fantasy lines, and, and a lot of people in their fantasies bump people off and, and, um, and have battles and all the rest of it. Um, but there's a sort of intricate detail about this fantasy life, which was, which was very unusual. On and on and on, different uh, battles, but all the actual historical situations in factual detail. Knight's fantasies centered on the famous last stands of history. Often, they ended in his own heroic and honorable death. He was a German soldier in General Paulus's 6th Army, doomed and encircled at the Battle of Stalingrad. He was a French paratrooper besieged by the Viet Minh in the valley of Dien Bien Phu. He favored right-wing causes. Often, he was a South African policeman gunning down blacks at Sharpville or Soweto. Yeah, I mean, so vivid were his imaginings that he'd be sitting in the schoolroom, for example, and uh, he'd look out of the window, and uh, he'd see you know, people walking past. He'd Im immediately imagine this into an ambush situation and into military terms, and flavor it in that sort of way. And these are very vivid to him. Julian Knight's bizarre fantasy life was still under control. In real life, he poured his heart and soul into the cadets. In 1984, he transferred to Melbourne High School, mainly because it had the best cadet force in the city. To his friends at Melbourne High, he came over as a normal kid, even a bit of a joker. The only thing that struck them as unusual was his fierce determination to join the army. That was his one and only ambition, was to be an officer in the army. Um, and that's all he aimed for. That's why he was in cadets, that's why he was in the Army Reserve. Most young men in the Army Reserve take their weekend soldiering light-heartedly. You know, your friends can be envious to know that you've fired a mortar or something like that, something they'll never ever see. And it's just great fun. But the reserve trains its part-time soldiers in the use of some very deadly weapons. Simon Chen and Des MacArthur both went on a two-week assault troopers course with Julian Knight in 1986. We got trained with it, well, in 11 weapons in those two and a half weeks at Pakapanyal. Um, anything from a 9mm Browning pistol to 50 calibre to 30 calibre machine guns. You think, eat, sleep, walk, talk, everything's army. You know, Especially on an army reserve camp because it's so concentrated. Um, you just go into army mode. You you talk about killing as if it was an everyday thing. Um, talk about bombs, hand grenades, rifles, pistols. The frightening thing about it is I could pick up any one of those weapons today and use it competently and cause horrible damage to whatever you were using it against. Most people in the Army Reserve fantasise about walking down the street with an SLR in your hand and feeling the power you might get, but no one ever does it. Like you, you're Rambo when you're out on the Army Reserve, but when you go home you go back to being a plumber or whatever. Everyone joked around, you know, I'm a trained killer. Julian did, but in a different light. He was more dedicated than anyone else I knew. Anyone else. This is a, someone who was trained from the time he was a young boy for years and years on how to use weapons. It, if we could have people like Julian Knight and just keep them in a deep freeze until a war broke out, that would be an ideal solution. Julian Knight had a fascination for guns. As an army reservist, he had no trouble getting a shooter's license. The Ruger 22 rifle was my uncle's. Uh, he gave that to me for my 18th birthday. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, Saturday's birthday. And the um, Mossberg shotgun and the M14 I bought from Frank O'Reilly's gun store in High Street, Thornbury. Did you uh, have a shooter's license for them? Yes, yeah. all registered. Uh, they're all registered. Yeah. That didn't seem unusual to me because I'm in the Army Reserve as well and guns are an everyday thing. Um, and he just talked about them as a collector would talk about stamps. Um, he just had an interest in them, not in the note of using them to kill people with. But in fact, Knight's fantasies about killing and being killed in combat were as strong as ever. You, uh, you told me before that uh, you were uh, from the age of about, uh, I think you said 16, uh, you had this uh, desire to kill someone. Is that right? Was that the first... Uh, desire to fight. Pardon? Desire to fight. I thought about East Timor in Jaro, Philippines. Mm -hmm. Thailand, Burma, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, um, Beirut, especially when we go to South Africa, mm -hmm. Central America, anywhere where there was a, a shit fight on. In 1986, Julian Knight signed up at La Trobe University, but after only six weeks, he left. The place he complained was full of leftover hippies from the 60s. Ironically, in the same year, Vesna Markoska graduated from the same university. Tuka jaz gi slikav Vesna sa majka je isti oden, ko ga diplomira na Latrobo University. I koliko bil ne veseli to ide na slikat? Well, when I first met her, people had told me that she'd come to Australia at a very... Um, Mature age, she was 14, I think, was that right? 13. 13. And yet she spoke English without an accent. She was um, going to university and it just surprised me. It was wonderful to know and, you know, about that. She could bring the Macedonian and the Australian together really well, whereas other people found it difficult to cope with the different cultures. Mm -hmm. She, um, they both fitted her easily. She didn't have trouble with one or the other. She could be what she had to be, where she had to be. Ovde vo dramata vo Australijo Australsko Makedonska drama grup kaj še gi šminkat artistite, a i ta isto igra ena uloga vo dramata. E popeto naše stalno odi oblečeno. Ne knjigo stretnaf na grobišta. Sređe leto nosi kožno palto. Vesna was stage manager originally and always said no, I'm not going to act, I don't want to act, I don't want to act and she acted every time and I mean she was great. Actually she was the one that sort of um, exposed me and brought me back to my Macedonian roots prior to that. Mm. I think we all went through that um, during high school where we didn't want to know about it. We were wogs and um, we didn't want to know you about rejected. that. Whereas she was so proud of her. Um, yeah, she, I mean I'd never sung in Macedonian, um, I didn't even know any songs, and yet through Vesna and Mary as well, all of a sudden we knew songs, we were singing songs, you know. Um, driving anywhere in the car, we'd be singing. And because we're all together in the choir, we were really lucky because Mary and Vesna did first voices and I did second voices. So wherever we sang, we had harmony, so our case <laughs> sound brilliant. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> In January 1987, Julian Knight was admitted for officer training at the Royal Military College, Duntroon. At 18, he was younger than most cadets. But he had passed the army tests, not just for academic ability and physical fitness, but for psychological suitability. Close the breach. Heat load! Heat load! Heat load! A lot of the officer training course is familiarising people with weapons and psychologically preparing them for combat. 
and hence uh, I think it's very important that selection is done very carefully and meticulously. There are psychological tests around that can indicate potential disturbance. They have scales uh, built into them that look at uh, potential for violence, psychopathy, depression, anxiety and so on. Now as I understand it in terms of the psychological input in relation to Mr Knight, uh, he had one uh, test to do which uh, was of brief duration and clearly in retrospect didn't look at those particular scales. They may look to at other things like leadership potential and management potential, but uh, not clinical uh, potential. I think in the first instance he'd been subjected to psychological examination, and that examination seeks to look for any evidence of maturity, uh, maladjustment or instability, and he passed that test. Uh, he was intelligent enough to come into this uh, environment. Now while he was here, his record was certainly not good, but that was more because of his immaturity, because he did have uh, trouble accepting authority and accepting the discipline that is involved in being a cadet at the Royal Military College. So everything in the blocks is on my name, so if anything goes missing, like rec room chairs and stuff like that, I've got to pay for it. Discipline at Duntroon is enforced by the senior cadets on their juniors. But Julian Knight had already shown at school and the Army Reserve that he did not take well to being so bossed about. On the assault troopers course, he was in the bad books as far as the NCOs and officers went. Um, you could tell that he didn't like being told what to do by everyone. Excuse me, please your bullets. Yes. But life for a first year cadet at Duntroon consists of little else but being told what to do. Well, top of the pockets aren't too bad. Look at this collar. The crease there. The creases that are meant to be there aren't sharp enough. Loose thread stuff could it kill away. How many times have you been told no loose threads on uniforms? Lots of times stuff get worse. Yo, my oath. Black mark. These trousers will have to be washed before you wear them again. With the rain, it's not going to dry too quickly. Tram track stuff, get it, Calloway. Stop your watch. Don't move when I'm talking to you. Stop your watch. When you're on the square, you're not allowed to move. You're not allowed to move now. Stop your watch. Tram track stuff, get it, Calloway, are a definite no-no. What are they? A definite no-no stuff. That's your right, stuff, Calloway. He did his best. He was very motivated, and yet he simply had a great deal of difficulty getting along with his commanding officers and the senior students. He himself has complained that he was very badly treated, uh, that he was bastardized, and indeed he was, as were other people uh, at RMC. I'd certainly make the point very clearly and firmly and emphatically that there is no way that I'd tolerate bastardization in the college. I've issued very implicit instructions to that effect, and I go to uh, great lengths to make sure that my instructions are carried out. He gave an example, and again, I can't comment on the veracity of this, but if it's true, it's very disturbing that he and another junior cadet were made to make toast for more senior cadets and then crawl on their hands and knees with the plates over furniture to deliver them and then to eat whole slices of toast with peanut butter on them whole. Now, that's disturbing behaviour. I mean, it's a lot more than childish behaviour. And if you have someone who's psychologically vulnerable, and they're exposed to this without an appropriate support mechanism and re release valve, then you're creating problems. Do you have any problems there? Uh, yes. What were your problems? Uh, personality clashes with senior cadets. Um, clashes with the instructing staff. Mm. What was that? Didn't like me. Mm. Did you like them? Not particularly. He was somebody who simply wouldn't buckle under the system. He simply wouldn't do as he was told. And the tension between he and the older cadets escalated. This then ended in an incident one night in a local nightclub. He was sure that he was going to be bashed by the other cadets. Uh, they apparently had the backing, or at least he believed they had the backing, of a staff member. Uh, he was in a club, he took a knife, and he went and stabbed one of the senior cadets twice in the neck. At the Private Bin nightclub in Canberra on the 30th of May, 
Julian Knight exploded in violent rage. He had done it before, he would do it again. But the army gave him no psychiatric treatment. It didn't advise him to seek it elsewhere. It simply asked him to go. Now, he was involved in the nightclub incident, but again, uh, there were others involved in that. Alcohol was a factor, and it's well known that when alcohol is involved, a large proportion of the population probably uh, are prone to violence in those situations. So there was nothing in his record, there was nothing that he did that would indicate uh, that he was abnormal in the sense of Hoddle Street that we could predict that. I've been assessing and treating uh, offenders uh, for many years now, m multiple murderers, not of this leg of course. And uh, I would say that any time that someone produces a knife and stabs someone in a public arena, such as a nightclub, it's time to be very concerned about what's going on for that person. Now, the counter-argument, of course, is that he was intoxicated, but that's missing the point in my view. And I think a lot more should have been done following that episode in terms of getting him involved in treatment and then when he was discharged from the army to debrief him and make sure that there was follow-on treatment when he returned to Melbourne. This didn't occur, and uh, I would suggest had it occurred, the probability of Hoddle Street occurring would have been substantially reduced. Have you had any psychiatric treatment or examination? No. Do you think that you're, you uh, have any mental problem? Yeah, my violent. Mm. How do you know that? Being upset and having having a, a few too many drinks, it's um, always ends up in violence. Mm. Find it hard, it can contain it to a point. Mm. You say you're getting upset, or well, you're upset tonight before this violence started? Yes. About what? Oh, I know a lot of it about my car, financial troubles. Mm ex-girlfriends, just springs to mind at the moment. Mm. He was kicked out of Duntroon. It ruined any prospect of a career, a military career, which I guess had been his whole dream. Um, he came back down here, probably didn't know what he wanted to do, saw no way out. Um, had a few drinks and then killed seven people. But see, even that doesn't seem enough. It seemed enough to Julian Knight. In the Royal Hotel in Clifton Hill, between 5.30 and 8.30 on the evening of August the 9th, he drank his way through a dozen beers and brooded on his troubles. Since leaving Duntroon, nothing had gone right. His mother had turned his bedroom into a sitting room and he was camping in his own house. His friends had deserted him. His girlfriend pointedly rejected him. So had his natural mother in South Africa, who had failed to reply to the letters he had sent her. He owed several thousand dollars to the bank, and to cap it all, the car he had been hoping to sell had packed up that afternoon with a broken gearbox. Now, each of these events are relatively small disruptions in one's life, but they combined to interact on someone with a particular set of personality problems. This boy has, in my view, several very serious difficulties. One is that he's overwhelmingly self-centered and immature. He sees things from his point of view and only from his point of view when there's a conflict with someone else. And he tends to get on other people's nerves to cause them to be irritated with him without him having any idea that he personally has produced this. This causes him to then feel like a victim. He collects uh, causes and injustices that other people have done this to him and other people have done that to him. Then all of this builds up a lot of rage and resentment and anger. So what you're saying is about half an hour before you uh, left the hotel, I decided that I'd, um, I'd go home and get my weapons and start shooting. Right. These are the three makes and types of weapons used at the Hoddle Street shootings. Uh, this one here is a Mosberg slide action repeating shotgun, 12 gauge. <coughs> this one is a uh, 
22 long rifle calibre Ruger, model 1022, which is a slide action repeating rifle. Uh, when this weapon is loaded and cocked, it will discharge as often as one places uh, separate pressures on the trigger. About how many rounds? Ten shots will hold. And this weapon here is a uh, 308 calibre Norinco self-loading repeater. Uh, it was a weapon of this type and make that uh, inflicted the most damage at Hoddle Street. told us that you left uh, by the front door here last yeah. night and you walked down towards the railway line with those three guns all yes. fully loaded. Is yes. that true? All right, we'll just follow... On the morning of the 10th of August, after his long interrogation in the police station, Julian Knight agreed to retrace his route of the night before for the police video camera. Can you do that now? Yes. Right, well, you, you just walk down there slowly and we'll follow along. And as I go, I want to talk to you, so just uh, keep with me. Throughout this extraordinary interview, Knight is cool, precise and detached. His apparent callousness was undoubtedly due in part to shock. Just go on the exact uh, route that you went last night. Uh, but, but it's also the way a trained soldier might behave at a military debriefing. Army training over. is one of the keys to Knight's behaviour yeah, that uh, night. Yeah. I came through this gap in the fence here. What we had was a trained killer who unfortunately exploded in rage and used the skill and the training that he'd acquired provided by our society against us. I can't remember exactly, but I think it was here that I first propped. What did you do here? I think this is where I started shooting. And uh, were you standing or...? Uh, kneeling. Kneeling? In which direction were you shooting? In that direction. Uh, and what were you shooting at? The uh, passing cars. To Julian Knight, these cars were just enemy. At times, he claimed later, he imagined he was on the streets of Beirut. But for more than 50 people, a normal journey along one of Melbourne's main thoroughfares was about to become a nightmare. Matthew Morrow was returning home from work. I drove past the station and um, I heard a thump hit the car. And I thought some kids throwing stones or something, so I leant forward. And as I leant forward, uh, the windscreen just exploded. All of a sudden this, uh, well, I thought it was a rock hit the window and um, I sort of went to s stop and I looked up and noticed it was a bullet hole and told the girls to quickly duck, we've been shot at. Did you hit these cars? Yes. Did you, do you know whether or not you hit any of the people in the cars? No. Once it started to run, he went into a military mode and uh, it was automatic, lie down, fire, um, change of position and so forth. It was totally automatic. Once that was set off, it was incapable of stopping it until he ran out of ammunition. Uh, I believed strongly I had a bullet on my head, definitely. As I, as I was pushing my hand against my head, I was scared to pull it out in, ca in case, you know, blood would come all out of me. Well, at that time we didn't know how many shots but there were quite a few coming through the car and um, we kept driving until we got down to the service station and I saw it was open I quickly screamed in here and quickly asked the girls if they're all right and they said yeah and I jumped out and I ran into the um, service station itself and I said um, to the guy quick ring the police we've been shot at. At that stage a car came screaming down south from Hoddle Street and we were right over in the west lane so she had a window down, horn blaring, screaming from the car. So we thought, you know, she was pretty distressed. So we um, activated the lights and went over to her straight away. And she just yelled out, get up there, this car's being shot at. Okay, calling a 303. Calling a 303. Calling a 303. We've just received a call um, from a passerby. There's two cars being shot at in Hoddle Street, just after Rosemead Street. All right, you left that area there. Where did you go then? To the edge of the uh, bushes here, yeah. by the sign. This stubby sign here. Yep. Where did you did you stop here anywhere? I propped there. Where about? Kneeling at the edge of the, where the bushes start here. Yeah, and what did you do there? Um, continued firing. 
Vesna Markoska had been at a party. She had insisted on leaving early to fetch her father's car from a friend. She drove it home along Hoddle Street, her boyfriend Zoran following in her own car. What was your intent when you were shooting at those cars? Shoot at the people in them. And what was your intent towards those people? Kill them. Right. Vesna was hit in the left arm. She got out of the car and staggered towards the roadside. A passing motorist, Robert Mitchell, got out of his car to help. Julian Knight shot them both. The first one fell onto the road and then the second one, I don't know where, where he came from, but um, I dropped him as well. Right. Now, did, you, did they appear to, to be dead when you... The one that fell back on the road wasn't. wasn't. What happened then? I let off another two rounds. For what purpose? Finish her off. I heard the shots then, seen all the cars facing us, which were stationary, all um, higgly piggly all around the road. Um, the shots were very close, and so then we've, my partner's reversed the van and cut off the northbound traffic lanes. From then. Sir Roger, 303, uh, presumably still on foot, is he? Where are we getting? He's still following. We're in Cemetery Road, we're heading that way. Right, but then things tended to seem to die down for a while, so I went back up to where my car was because I knew it had been damaged and I just wanted to see how badly. And by this stage, the police had started to arrive and there was a, a divvy wagon across Hoddle Street. And um, just as I got there, there was a, um, I don't know who it was, some bloke had come down. It was Vesna's fiancé, Zoran. A moment before, he had held the dying Vesna in his arms. Now, in desperation, he ran to Constable Bouchier's divvy van. He was so angry, obviously he was involved in it that um, he tried to grab the service revolver I had, which was still in its holster. Um, we had a short struggle, and um, I tried to settle him down. Well, he was yelling, you know, my girlfriend, my girlfriend. He had quite a strong accent, so I think he was, you know, Mediterranean or something like that. And just as he got to us, we could see his face was sort of covered in blood. He just wanted to, you know, give me my gun. Give me your gun, I want to go out and get him. You know, let me kill him, type of thing. There was another volley of shots, and the police force said, you know, just hit the deck and we sort of dropped down to the road and there were more shots and she said oh let's get out of here and um, I remember we crossed over to the park and we just sort of ran from tree to tree back to the service station. As the confusion mounted some local residents assumed there had been a traffic accident. Two of them including John Musket went to help. I was telling them not to go anywhere and other people were shouting out for them to stay away sort of thing. They sort of kept walking towards a car that, uh, that had been shot at and uh, they had about 10 yards away from the road and got shot themselves. For some reason I, there was no shooting and I just went to try and help them and got about 10 yards away from them and was shot myself. And then just out of the blue, sort of everything happened so quickly, a police car just came, did a U-turn out in front of me and like stopped directly in front of me, asked me to reverse, just hopped out of his car and said, look, reverse, screamed it out. And of course I thought, oh, oh okay, fair enough. So I've put my car in reverse and as I put my car in reverse, I sort of just looked in the direction where the train station was and there's this um, man standing with a gun pointing directly at us. Well, of course, <laughs> like anybody's reaction was, um, Geez, let, let's get out of here real quick. You didn't know what, what to expect, you know? Because you could hear f shots firing, you know? A few times I looked up and looked around, seen policemen running around, you know, telling everyone still to keep down. So you didn't know where he was, you know? Just standing here, could you indicate where you fired the shots from? Uh, behind that rock. Behind this rock. Uh, those cartridge cases there, are they related to your shooting or yes. do they appear to be? Yeah, and where, what were you firing at from that position? Um, I fired at 
the two cars that went past and then the mo motorcyclist. Right. Is that the motorcycle there? Yes. Which way was he travelling? Towards the city. Yes, and uh, did you uh, hit the motorcyclist? Yes, yeah. I hit him about here and he swerved. Yes, go on. And that's where he fell. Yes, and when he fell, what, can you describe what happened when he fell? Well, he was moaning um, in agony, and so I put another two rounds into him. What was the purpose in doing that? To finish him off. Oh, you mean to kill him? Yes. yes. This cold-blooded and deliberate murder of innocent and wounded victims was apparently something very different in Knight's battle-deluded mind. To him, they were acts of mercy by a soldier in combat. That at least is how he explained them to the police. No, it's just something I would, it was always impressed on me. It's, it's better to be killed than to be seriously wounded. Mm. And this bloke sounded seriously wounded. So you thought he was better off dead? A car came flying down south from the scene itself, which I intercepted, and it had one male who was driving, um, a child in the front seat on its mother's lap. The mother was lying down, and he's just screaming, he's killed my wife, my wife's dead. Um, at that stage, other police were on the scene and it was organised that the child be removed and they talked the male from leaving the car because he was, didn't want to leave his wife. Um, the first ambulance we organised to go straight to her. A little boy came in and I remember seeing blood all over his face, around his side, and um, he came running up to Nikki and I and all I remember him saying is, Mummy, 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 still in car. And that's when his father broke down crying, said, No, Mummy's gone. And Nikki and I, that's when we really broke up. The, the driver just wanted to get back and get whoever had done it. And then I remember him seeing his baby and just going over and grabbing the baby and just sitting down on the concrete and just crying. As a, you know, it's the saddest thing you know, that I've seen and I'll never forget that, that part of it. You said before that you had this desire to kill someone in combat. Why did you suddenly decide to kill these people? It was like one big dream. Yeah. It's kind of like I could have been in Beirut and I wouldn't have known the difference. And Especially when... That's another question. Did a cop have a shot at me? I don't know. I don't know. Don't Julian Knight insists that at one stage in his first shooting spree, someone fired back. There's no evidence that he's right. The significant thing is his reaction. I heard that shot run out, and, um, because it was in a pause between shots, and I kind of thought, you know, great, now there's some fire coming back my way, uh, and kept on going, it kind of urged me on even further, because I knew the end. Well, I thought then that people were going to start shooting back. Right. Yeah. So were you happy about that? Yeah. Why were you happy about that? Well, I wanted, like I said, I wanted to be in combat to see what it's like. Mm. You think that's uh, a little bit unnatural to uh, have that desire? A lot of people have told me that. Mm. Knight apparently believed that his long-held fantasy to be in battle had at last become reality. He adopted classic combat tactics. He left the street and ran up the railway line. Well, you say an escape and evasion, was that your purpose? Yep. Can't shoot you if they can't find you. Right. Well, you told me before that you had a desire to be shot. Yeah, I still had ammo, though. So what are you saying? You weren't prepared to be shot when you ran out of ammunition? Oh, 
Well, it's, I wanted to keep on going until I ran out of ammo. Некој зазва на троп на. Јас мислам оти некој иди во визита да дојди. И кога ја отвори вратата, го гледам Зоран Сијово крв. Поблена вика, Мике вика, пука некој на нас вика, ни степа. И весна веле е погодена. Nilan ran back with Zoran the few hundred meters from his house in Daly Street to Hoddle Street. Oi, I think these guys need some help. This guy's got this guy's both covered in, his head. He's got covered in blood, though. He needs a bit of help, I think. By this time, the police had blocked the street off. Zoran and Milan could not get near to Vesna. Zoran was not badly wounded. Most of the blood was Vesna's. In the end, it was Milan, under acute stress, who suffered an asthma attack and had to be treated in an ambulance. He still did not know whether his daughter was alive or dead. No one on Hoddle Street knew where the gunman was, or indeed how many gunmen there were. In fact, Julian Knight was a kilometre away by now, hiding near a creek that runs beside the railway line. All right. I followed the foundations of the bridge right around to where those uh, bluestone bricks make up the wall. Yes. And uh, did you fire any shots in that area? No, I jumped over the fence, uh, moved along about another 10 metres and fired one shot at the police car. It just started to run straight up to where the police car was across the tram tracks there on the southern lanes when I was um, shot at. I don't know, still don't know where the um, offender was. Um, the bullet went straight across my back and between my arm, blew my tunic apart. Um, I kept running and dived behind the police car there and got in and radioed um, for urgent assistance. I'm pretty sure I saw some movement under the railway bridge on the southern bank of the creek. I didn't want to give us away too much, so I moved the light around a little bit and we gradually came back around. I brought the light back onto that spot and from there all the action really started. Did you uh, fire up in the air? Yes. Air 495, urgent. Air 495, go. Air 495, we've just been hit underneath the helicopter. Um, at this stage, all systems still OK. I saw sparks fly out from under the, the machine on this side. I was sitting up here. Um, felt like the floor of the helicopter jumped about 6 to 12 inches. It really felt like it jumped like, uh, quite a deal. Air 495, VKC. Air 495. 495, we've been uh, hit underneath. We have to put down in an overall uh, check damage. Okay. Ever since he'd started firing, Knight had been looking for a gun battle. He'd been hoping to take on the Police Special Operations Group, the SOG. But he was disappointed. Did you regard this as being in combat tonight? With the police, yes. I suspected, when I shot at the helicopter, I was expecting return fire because I thought there'd be an SOG marksman in there. Mm. I'm disappointed when nothing came except it just flew off and came back. Back on Hoddle Street, six people were already dead. For some time, Sergeant Peter Butts sat on the pavement with a seventh victim, Gina Papayanu. She was critically wounded. That's the only time that I, I knew the girl. It may have been for 20 or 30 minutes, or I just don't know now, but um, it's just like a... Uh, it's like someone you've known for a long time. I mean, uh, I thought that uh, at the time when I saw her, I mean, her, her wounds were horrific, but she uh, was quite conscious and... Uh, and talking to me and uh, I think we even uh, had a bit of a laugh amongst our conversation. I, I wanted to more or less let her know that we were trying to do the best we could 
in the circumstances, but... Um, but in the chaos and uncertainty, it was almost an hour before it was thought safe enough for an ambulance to reach her. She died 11 days later in the Alfred Hospital. By 10.15, Julian Knight had only nine rounds left in his magazine and a bullet in his pocket, which he later claimed was for himself. He was running down McKean Street, heading towards his ex-girlfriend's house, where he was spotted by a cruising police car. It was fairly dark. There were um, a lot of cars parked along the side of the street and trees, and the lighting wasn't really adequate. Uh, I only twice caught a glimpse of somebody running ahead of us along the right-hand side, and we followed him along there. And then uh, I lost sight of him when he uh, ran to the front yard of uh, a house, which was near a laneway that came off McKean Street. Um, I heard the police car behind me, and it was travelling at some speed, so I turned into the alley here yeah. and propped here. I drove in the middle of the road and slammed on the brakes, and I tried to get the car to fishtail around so that the headlights would be facing the laneway and uh, both police got out and I stood up and let off what was left in the magazine. The unit uh, urgent. Two and three, we're off Russell Crescent, about 200 metres. At that stage I thought I'd been shot in the head and uh, I sort of fell out of the car door onto the roadway to get away. I uh, crawled on the ground to the back of the car trying to find cover. It's like uh, when somebody's shooting at you, you immediately try and find uh, any cover at all. A blade of grass would have looked good at the time. What were you firing at? Just at the car. Right. Muzzle flash was so great at that rate of fire that I could hardly see it anyway. The noise of the gunshots was so loud, it was incredible. You could. Uh, I almost felt at one stage that he must have been standing right above me and firing into me. The sound was incredible. I bent back down like this. Knight had come to the end of the road. But when he searched for the final bullet, it was gone. Yes. Took the magazine off and searched for the round and couldn't find it. Knight claims that so army training now took over. And then A soldier, are, cornered and out of ammunition, right. should no. surrender. So I put the hand of the rifle out like that, rested it on the ground and let it drop. And they were screaming at me to put my hands up and, and come out, which I did like that. I got about that high, and one of the policemen took a shot, so I ducked back down again. I saw his head sort of appear near some bushes, and I just stood up. I already had the gun in my hand. I, I don't even remember pulling the, the gun from my holster at all. And uh, I actually stood up and away from the car, out in the open, and I shouldn't have done that. That was a bit silly, but uh, and just took took an aim at him and fired a shot. And as soon as I fired, he uh, went out of sight and I thought I'd hit him. And they started yelling out again. I said, well, don't shoot. Kept screaming, you know, don't shoot me. And uh, he was a total coward. I'd never, you know, utter contempt for the way he, he was pleading. Only a few moments, he, uh, he hadn't given us a chance at all. Hadn't even waited for us to get out of the police car. The only opposition he encountered the whole time of what he did that night. And uh, he was just scared. And uh, we just arrested him, brought him to the police car, and uh, did what we were supposed to do, searched him, handcuffed him. That was the end of that. The atmosphere here this morning is one of desolation. Huddle Street looks and feels like a ghost town. There's a sense of disbelief, as if this just couldn't happen here, but everywhere there are brutal reminders. The shells of cars, shattered windscreens. I just can't, uh, can't believe it. It's, uh, I know the area so well, and I walk around here with uh, my wife and baby, and now you're here with all the police, and it's cordoned off, and cars there, and murder, and... Just uh, staggering.
the whole thing's really quite chilling. Just to see all the cars as they are now with, you know, toys still in them and dresses from, well, dry cleaning, I suppose, going home from picking that up. Just awful. I think I felt like all Victorians bewildered. You were people just going about their daily businesses, shot down, and it took me some time to, to comprehend just what had happened. I received a phone call from the minister, I think, in bed that night. Uh, at that stage, uh, the full details were not known. And as the details emerged, uh, and the, the full impact of it all, uh, I suppose, uh, came to us, we just realised this, this is happening in our city, in a place where uh, I think most of us thought uh, uh, that kind of thing would never happen. I thought, no, I know that guy. People you know don't do that kind of thing. But, uh, no, I just thought it couldn't be him. I, I heard the name and I thought, oh, I know, I know him. And I went and looked at the TV and they had his picture on there. And it's him, it's him. I, it shocked me. In their little house in Daly Street, it was the end of the longest night in the Markovsky family's life. Sitte telefonira po bolnici, po hospitali, da prašat kako, da li ima tako ime tam, ovo ona. Cela noć je bara. Cela noć je bara v nesite, mrazdeš, in niko je ništo ne ni kaza zavestno, da li je otepana ali je raneta. Posle so bali tukove na očutevi? Se bali više. Policija tako da dojde. Da dojde 20 policajci, vika, betlak. Kako betlak ne be, ne je to za betlak. Jaz ne priznam betlak, da nekoj si go izpolni žalba, da da otepova lujke, betlak. Kako betlak? To ne je betlak. To je ubistvo. Krozno ubistvo. Nasilstvo. In the town of Shepparton, 200 kilometers north of Melbourne, it had been a normal morning at Ashton Road when motorcyclist Shane Stanton's father left for work. No, well, actually, I was yet at uh, work and the phone rang. The boss said, uh, he's looking at me. He said, well, he said, I told him not to tell us anything to you. He said, but he said, the police are on their way out. And uh, anyway, out they come. And they said, we're not sure, but we're 90% sure that it was Shane. This wasn't until... Uh, uh, past 10 on the Monday morning. Well, I can't remember. It's just shock. Just absolutely shocked. Remember stamping around, inventing a few more four-letter words, and it's just... Well, you don't believe it. I'd come back to work, and as the boss said, there's been a telephone call for you. He said, you've got to go to your dad's place. And he said, straight away, he said, no mucking around, going anywhere else. He said, go straight there. He said, I think there may have been a death in the family. So I took off and I thought, my grandparents, someone older in the family. And earlier that morning we'd been talking about what happened in Melbourne. And I was just around a corner and I thought, Shane. And I thought, nah, wouldn't be Shane. Not, he wouldn't be out that time of night. And I so I come in here and Dad said to me, sit down. I said, I don't want to sit down. He said, I told you to sit down. Because he, he told me, and it just brought me, just unstuck straight away. And I didn't want to believe it. And it was just that bloody hard. Seven early deaths, seven funerals, seven private circles of grief which spread in ripples. It spread through families, through workplaces, through communities and out across the world. From far off Macedonia, Vesna Markoska's sister Susie flew in to join her bereaved parents. After her death, Vesna's family found a prayer in her private journal. No one knows what prompted it, 
but it was the last thing that Vesna Markoska ever wrote. Oh Lord, I'm scared. I fear for the future. I cannot understand the meaning of death before you've lived your life fully and experienced everything in life. If a person is brought into this world, I think they deserve to live their whole life in peace without any interruption. Lord, it hurts when you lose a loved one. It leaves a scar that never heals and is always bleeding, despite everything you try to do to help it heal. So please, God, I beg you, please try and prevent all these horrible things from happening to people so the pain could be spared. I have faith in you, Lord. Thank you. Vesna. But it was not only the families of those who died who were affected. Altogether, more than 50 people were shot at in Clifton Hill. Most of them found the experience deeply disturbing. I tried to forget, but I just can't, you know, I just always think about it and, you know, you know other people that were involved in that, it's just... It's not every day you get in the street and see a couple of dead bodies on the road. You know, it's just hard. It'll take a long time to get out of your system. We decided that we would have the self-help groups. We would have um, sessions at the community health centre where people who had been affected, any people at all who felt they wanted to come along, um, could come along and talk about it. They could talk about how they felt on the night of the shooting, what their involvement was how they could get their lives back together again, to com uh, become normal again. Uh, I heard somewhere, I read somewhere, uh, saying that uh, it's nearly impossible to be the same again. In other words, what has happened to us mentally uh, or psychologically, is, is, it's impossible to come back to the uh, original state of mind. There's a young couple who came here and they had both been shot at and they came every week uh, for I think the first six times we all met together. And they said that they really feel now that they can put it behind them, they certainly won't forget about it, but they know with each passing week that it's certainly improving. You didn't come to the group for, two, for nearly two and a half months, so maybe, as you said, you bottled a lot of those feelings up and... We'll all have the mental scars of that event you know, for a long time. I don't think anyone will ever, you know, that's been injured will ever forget it. Um, I don't think it's something you should forget either. Ten weeks after the massacre, a memorial service was held on the site of the shootings in Hoddle Street. And it is by sharing the great events of our lives that we become a community, both joyful events and tragedies. Separately, we received the news of the shootings here. Separately, the victims fell. And together, we are going to set up a memorial to the event, which will also be a step in healing the harm it has done. Well, I felt I've done the good thing, you know. I went there to be with them. They need people to support them. That's why I went. For many of those involved in the shootings, the service had a healing effect. I'd been going through a really hard time, mentally more than anything, a couple of weeks before that service. Sort of the time come when we could put a bit of earth back around the trees. I sort of said to myself, well, here goes the shovel. In underneath everything was all my troubles. Sort of symbolic, I suppose. balloons took off and a lot of people said they, they were 
sailing over the knight's house and that seemed really mm -hmm. appropriate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And business house, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. For the Markovskis especially, isolated from most of their neighbours by language, the grief went on. Alice Cairns found that they were the hardest to help. Uh, I worked with a friend of theirs to organise help for them uh, in all sorts of ways, um, particularly with the community services to arrange help for them. Uh, then Mr. Makovska was eager to um, find out just how his daughter had died. He said he felt let down that the police had only come along and said, uh, I'm sorry, your daughter's been killed. He didn't know how. He knew it was from a shooting, but he didn't know to what degree the injuries uh, she'd sustained and which particular injury had killed her, but he did want to know detail. Milan Markovsky's determination to know precisely how Vesna had died might seem macabre, but knowing the details seemed to help him come to terms with the reality of his daughter's death. I went uh, to see um, Detective yeah. Kent, Graham Kent, I spoke to him, right. and I had a look at the photographs, yeah. and um, I suppose I should have perhaps brought a model along to show you, yeah. but he told me that, uh, or he showed me the photographs, yeah. and she did have, uh, before she left the car, she was yeah. already injured. She had um, injuries to her arm, uh, shoot shot in her arm, yeah. and some in her head. Now, the left side, yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. We don't know why she left the car. Maybe she left because she was injured and yeah. she was frightened, and so she stopped. So both cars had shots in them, and Zoran probably had injuries at the same time. Uh, while he was there with her, um, he, she was shot again in the side. That seems to be in the side, around about here and the back. And it was a very, it was a different gun, different type of fire of the power. And this is probably what caused her death. This weapon can be loaded by simply removing the magazine. The weapon which first wounded Vesna Markovska was the .22 Ruger, the sort of hunting rifle sold by the thousand in Australia every year. But the gun that killed her and five of the six other victims was the .308 calibre Chinese Norinco rifle, a totally different matter. Well, this weapon in the wrong hands is quite a terrifying weapon. It fires a high velocity bullet, a military cartridge, and obviously designed for military use. Uh, and inflict quite a, a gross wound into a human being. This ferocious military weapon was bought quite legally by 19-year-old Julian Knight, who kept it under his mother's bed in the middle of Melbourne. To many residents of Clifton Hill, that seemed extraordinary. Drawing back the cocking handle, like so, and the weapon is now ready to be fired. Those sort of weapons, they're designed for military action. They're designed for a soldier to cut down 20, 30 people in one go. Those sort of weapons are just not on. They're just unacceptable to us. But we, you can make good gun laws, and anybody who believes you can't make good gun laws really doesn't believe in the future of democracy. A meeting of residents at Clifton Hill deplore the fact that there are guns and ammunition in the suburbs and that we're all at risk. Or... Jack Resenbrink called an anti-gun meeting in Clifton Hill soon after the shootings. Nearly 50 locals turned up. I don't think you'll stop people killing other people. It's just a matter of how many they manage to kill when they're crazy. Yeah. That's right. the difference. Yes, and also, if you can put time between the impetus and the weapon, the person may, in fact, change their mind. It's, and so it's the person who has that cachet of automatic weapons that becomes extremely dangerous. The only one thing that would have, in fact, uh, prevented this happening um, was the, would be the uh, uh, unavailability of guns. This is perhaps the most fundamental lesson that we can learn from this. Um, this wouldn't have happened if there weren't guns readily available, because there would have been a cooling off process, you wouldn't have run them off. 
Four months after Hoddle Street, another killer ran amok in Melbourne. In Queen Street, central Melbourne. Frank Vitkovich, 22, a law student from Preston, entered the Australia Post Office block armed with a cut-down 30 calibre semi-automatic M1 carbine, the American World War II service rifle. During the next 15 minutes, eight people were to be shot dead and five wounded. Vitkovich killed himself at 4.30 by jumping from the 11th floor. I know that when I first heard about the Queen Street shootings that I was really shocked. I thought, if it's happened twice, it, it will happen again. If it can happen in your office, in, in, in a building, uh, an 18-storey building, where can you be safe in, in the city? We're not safe in our homes, we're not safe in the workplace, uh, we're not safe on the roads. <laughs> And where are we going to feel safe and secure? After Queen Street, uh, there was no doubt left in my mind that we had to try and do more to reduce the number of guns. And I repeat, it gets back to the number of guns. There's about four million lying around this country. There's 130,000 new guns a year coming in lawfully through the Customs Department. So we've got a, an ongoing battle. Soon after Queen Street, the Kane government declared an amnesty for unauthorised gun owners. Thousands of illegally owned weapons were handed in. But this was a drop in the ocean. The real problem the governments of Victoria and New South Wales believed was the number and type of legally owned weapons. They pressed for much tougher gun laws, not just in their own states, but throughout Australia. In Canberra, the Prime Minister convened a special Premier's conference. John Kane went in determined. I've never said that uh, hard gun laws that reduce the numbers of guns available are the entire solution. But they certainly will reduce the prospects of what we had in Queen Street and Hoddle Street uh, occurring again. I'm prepared to do anything that uh, reduces that prospect. But inside, Victoria and New South Wales failed to make much headway against some unyielding opposition. Unfortunately, the Queenslanders and the Tasmanians are not prepared to come with us, and uh, Tasmania wants to adopt a laissez-faire approach. We are going to introduce laws in our states that uh, take away what is regarded as some as the, the God-given right to have a gun. To the gun owners, Kane's words were blasphemy. He ran into ferocious opposition a lot closer to home than Tasmania. For them. But what we're here for is to defend a liberty, a liberty, a, a civil liberty we had since Australia was founded. At base, it was a clash between the city and the country. From all over Victoria, 30,000 gun owners had come to cram the streets of Melbourne in protest. Opposition leader Jeff Kennett had first supported the government, but he soon changed his tune under the pressure. Let me say this to you about law and order and guns. As Christmas came and went, the gun law debate reverberated out across the nation leaving Hoddle Street and its victims far behind. We will stick by the position that we established in December of last year that we are going to prohibit semi-automatic rifles. These two psychopathic killers could have been matter from heaven, as far as Kane's concerned, for an excuse to grab the guns, and it's backfired. The Victorian government was forced, reluctantly, to moderate its legislation. But the grief, the rage and frustration of Milan and Vangelia Markovsky remained unmoderated. He closed my family. He closed my family, you know. He closed another family, another six family, you know. Because Julio make big massacre, you know. I feel like uh, one bar of petrol, you know. 
uh, one barrel petrol and and somebody put match to the barrel and make big boom, you know. Yeah. Julian Knight knew that feeling all too well. In the police station, hours after his explosion in Hoddle Street, he had entered the eerie calm of post-traumatic shock. But a few days later, he would suffer a suicidal nervous breakdown. At his trial, it was revealed that he lay screaming in a hospital cell, strapped in a straitjacket. It related to him having some insight into the magnitude of what had occurred. Much has been said about the lack of remorse and uh, so on, but I think the fact that he did break down like this shows that there was some feeling in terms of what had occurred. I mean, if you can imagine uh, the uh, <coughs> situation where you wake up one day and you suddenly realize that you run amok and kill ten people, how would you feel? And the thing is, you can go to prison and visit him today, and he's one of the nicest, politest 20-year-olds you could meet. But the scary thing is that you've know, you know what he's done. It's really frightening. We talk about the actual crime a lot. The night, like shooting down the police helicopter, and he goes into great detail about those sort of things. Um, but there's no real analysis of it. It's just description. I think he gets a buzz out of describing it, but not. it's not in a, a sick way. Uh, it's, or it's really hard to explain. I don't want to make him sound sick because he doesn't sound sick. It just sounds like he's describing something that's removed from himself. Like he wasn't there, he didn't do it. It's probably like something he's read in a book. Have you got any feeling of regret over these people dying? Yes. What do you think about it now? I regret that it had to be civilians and I regret that I was captured rather than killed. Mm. Did you want to die yourself? Yeah. Why didn't you then just go and commit suicide somewhere? I'd rather... I'd want someone else to put bullets through my head. Sometimes I... Uh, I wish... I think things would be easier for a lot of people. Not myself, but... Um, for all those families. If, uh, if that one bullet had it hit him in the head and would have finished everything. At least now they would uh, have some peace. And uh, for some of them, they'll never have any, any peace, but uh, it would have been uh, perhaps better for them had he have died. But uh, I can't unchange what happened, and, uh, and I'm glad for myself that I didn't kill him, because I uh, never want to kill anyone. I'd like to get a gun and shoot him myself. I, um... I, I don't know. I, I really do think he knows what he's done. And um, they just want to let me get hold of him, that's all. He must be died. Because my best name is died, go in the ground, he must go there too. Because Australia must be clean from the idiot, from the criminal, from the everything, you know. Australia must be one day good country, you know. I can understand the, the anger and frustration of relatives and if I were in their position, I'd probably be feeling the same way. If the death penalty was part of our system, then sure, he'd go to the gallows. But uh, at the same time, because I know him, because I, I knew him when he was a person and not just the crazed killer, I know that there's a lot more there that he can offer. He can redeem himself. He's got a lot to contribute, I think into helping society come to some understanding of what's gone on, what's happened, what's gone wrong. Is there anything further you want to say about the matter? No. It will be 27 years at least before Julian Knight sees a street again. But the chairman of the new National Committee on Violence agrees with Julia Baggio that Knight can be more used to society alive than dead. I think that we should learn from Julian Knight's experience. Uh, he's very rare not only because he's a mass murderer, but because he survived. Most mass murderers either kill themselves or are killed by 
uh, those who are seeking to end the event. We can learn uh, about what went on in his mind, I suspect. We can learn much more about his background. We can uh, hopefully uh, begin to appreciate what it is that leads some very ordinary people like Julian Knight, because he is like the guy next door in many ways, and we, uh, we don't sort of have a label on him which says, I'm going to be a mass murderer. I think these are things that uh, hopefully the society too will begin to understand, that many of these people who finally break, run amok, are, in a sense, still ordinary citizens. And so the story of Hoddle Street ends where we began, with the ordinary lives of ordinary citizens. On any Friday night, normal young men leave the city to train in the use of deadly weapons. Every evening we come home from work to our ordinary sitting rooms, where the TV set brings images of war and confrontation from every corner of the globe. We can go out to the cinema any night of the week to see bare-chested heroes slaughter gooks by the hundred. Or stay at home with a video and watch innocent victims being chopped up with chainsaws. This is the normal world into which a young man emerged from his ordinary front door to massacre seven people in three quarters of an hour. Thank you.